the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our lives. Amen. So we have our Galatians reading talking about faith, and I want to reflect on faith. It says, now before faith came. Um, Faith is one of those words that we use all the time in the church, Uh, like love. We use love all the time in the church, and like hope and grace. We use these words all the time, um, and we think we know what they mean. Um, And then you say, well, what what is faith? If I asked you, what is faith? What is faith? What would you say? Belief? The hope for things unseen. Hope in things unseen. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, I think belief without concrete evidence. Belief without concrete evidence. Yeah. Like I believe my car's going to start. Like you believe your car's going to start. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. I, I like that analogy. Um, I, you know, I find with all those words, like we do have some sense of what faith is, right? We do have... Uh, some sense that it is it is this hope in things unseen this confidence in in something you know whatever um, belief you know but and it, I I find like love like hope like grace all these words are words that I I feel like I'm spending my whole spiritual life trying understanding further and gaining deeper understanding of uh, you know when I was a child I grew up in a conservative Lutheran church where faith basically meant giving intellectual assent to 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 right teaching or right doctrine, right? It was the Book of Common Accord and what Luther taught. And so they would never say this, that faith was basically you believe certain teachings of the church, but that's kind of what they meant. That's what faith was. If you, if you had faith, you believed uh, that, that this, is, this is what the Bible says and it is most certainly true was the refrain. And it was different than what the Presbyterians believed or the Baptists or the Catholics. They were a little off in their theology, but we Lutherans had it right. Um, and, you know, when I became, as I grew up, I realized actually it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I was struck by the fact that the disciples who spent three years with Jesus, who were like, were hearing it from Jesus's mouth over and over and over again, didn't get it and didn't understand. And it made me realize, actually, we don't often get it either. What makes us think that faith is related to knowledge? Um, now, sometimes we think of faith as kind of this emotional state. It's like, you know, if you're feeling good and you're feeling like God is on your side, you got faith, and when you're feeling bad and you're feeling like God is distant, you don't have faith, right? Um, it's kind of fickle like in, or, or, or fluctuating like an emotion. Um, and I'm not sure that gets at it either. Uh, faith in the passage just before we read in Galatians, there's a phrase that through the faith that Paul, that Paul writes, through faith in Jesus Christ. So through faith in Jesus Christ. Now the Greek phrase can also be translated through the faith of Jesus Christ. So through faith in Jesus Christ, make it sound like it's our faith in Jesus that's the key thing. Our faith in Jesus that's the real thing that matters. But if you translate it through the faith of Jesus Christ, our faith isn't the key thing. It's actually Jesus' faithfulness towards us. It's Jesus' faith that matters. And in some ways, that makes more sense, given what Paul is saying. He says, you've been clothed with Christ, um, that, that, and, and now you've put on Christ, and you belong to Christ. And there is now no longer slave nor free, male nor female, um, Jew nor Greek. That it's something God does. And this notion that somehow faith is something that first and foremost starts with God and it's God's movement towards us. It's actually God's faith in us or God's faithfulness towards us. Um, and that shifts this whole faith thing into kind of a relational dynamic. Um, it's not about what you believe so much or it's not about what you feel. It's about this, this posture, this, this relationship towards this being in communion with God and how that changes us and how that impacts us, even beyond our, our limited ability, right? And our, our acceptance of that, our, our willingness to enter into that, our turning towards it matters, but it's not on us, it's on God. Um, 
It's that lens that I want to read the, the stories that we read today. So we read these passages from Kings and Luke and then the Psalm. And I think in, in all of them, there are examples of faith. And what does it mean to have faith? And so the story from Kings is about Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of Israel. He has all kinds of wild stories where the power of God is active and doing stuff. And the, the chapter that precedes what we read today um, you know, the, the king of Israel has married a woman who, Jezebel, who, you know, she believes in other gods and the, the gods of Baal. And so she wants to bring the, the god Baal and the prophets of Baal into Israel. Um, and then there's this tension. And um, so Elijah has this big showdown with the prophets of Baal and says, okay, whose god really has power? <laughs> whose god really um, uh, is worthy of the name God, right? Is basically what he's doing. And so they have this showdown where there's 450 p prophets of Baal and uh, two cows, two oxen, and they each built, the, the plan is to each build an altar. And so the prophets of Baal build their altar, put firewood on it, slaughter the cow, and then the goal is to have the, the Baal set the thing on fire. And so 450 prophets are praying and wailing and cutting on themselves and shedding blood, shedding their blood in order to get the god ball to set this thing on fire and it goes on and on and on and on and it never gets set on fire and until you know starts in the morning goes up past midday and then finally elijah's like enough and so then he rebuilds the altar of israel that had fallen into disrepair and he puts wood on it slaughters his oxen and then pours 12 jars of water on top of it and then he prays to god and the thing lights, right? Gets on fire. Um, and so it's meant to be a demonstration of the power of God, the reality of God, the God, of God's faithfulness to Israel, even when Israel is not faithful. So Elijah has just come from this, and then he slaughters the prophets of Baal. And Jezebel and Ahab tells Jezebel this, she's irate, and she says, by my gods, you know, I will have this man die. And Elijah's full of fear. And so it's curious to me, this man's faith, right? This man's faith, this man who has had some experience of God or, um, and knows the power of God and has just come from this kind of demonstration um, where he was successful and triumphant in some ways. And now Jezebel's mad at him and he's full of fear and he goes running into the wilderness because he wants to die. That's what he's feeling. He just wants to die. Where is his faith? What is his faith in that moment? And as he's laying there asleep underneath this tree, an angel sets a meal before him and wakes him up and says, eat. And he eats and he goes back to bed. He wakes up again, and, the, and then the angel sets a meal again and wakes him up and says, eat, you need food for your journey. And so Elijah eats, and he goes on this journey for 40 days to Mount Horeb in our text, which is Mount Sinai. If you know anything about Mount Sinai, that's where Moses went up to the top of the mountain to receive the words of God and where Moses encountered the living God. And so now here, Elijah is making his journey 40 days, right? Which is like 40 years in the wilderness that the Israelites wandered, which is like 40 days of rain and night for Noah's Ark. It's like 40 is symbolic. He's going 40 days up to this mountain and he hides out in this cave. And God says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Why are you here? Do you even know what you're doing? And Elijah's like, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Um, Elijah's basically saying, I've done all this stuff for you, and now this is happening to me, and I don't like it, and... I am by myself, and now they're going to kill me, right? And the reality is he's not the only one that's left. There are those that are left, right? But he's feeling sorry for himself. He's, he's kind of hangry. He's hungry, angry, lonely, tired, 
you know when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you need to pay attention because, you know, um, you're not in your right mind. And so here he is feeling sorry for himself. And God's like, what are you doing here? And so God says, go to the mouth of the cave. And Elijah goes to the mouth of the cave. And Elijah, who's seen the power of God, experiences the power of God. He experiences this wind that blows through, and, and God is not in the wind. And he experiences this earthquake that shakes the, the, the foundations of the mountain, and stones are tumbling, and God is not in the earthquake. And then there's this fire that just burns the top of the mountain, and God is not in the fire. Elijah expects God to be in those plate things. And God's not in any of them. And then there's the sound of sheer silence. It's that silence that we listen to after communion. It's the silence that lays at the heart of all being, that stillness, that peace. That's not absence. It's the fullness of God and the still, small voice of God. And Elijah has that experience of being in the presence of God. And he comes out of the cave and he wraps this mantle around his head because he's in awe. And God says to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And Elijah's like, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets, and I am only the one left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He says the exact same thing that he said before. Doesn't change his tune at all. He's still, you know, thinking, I'm not getting what I'm due, and, and, and I'm all by myself, and... This isn't fair. And God's like, oi vey. <laughs> this stiff-necked people, right? They just don't get it. Elijah didn't get it, right? It wasn't about understanding God. It wasn't about what he felt about God. It was, he even had this profound experience of God, and it still did not impact him. And so God's like, you know what? Go. Go back. Anoint this dude king. Anoint this other dude king. Find yourself this... Uh, Elisha, who's going to be your follower, just go and do that. And so Elijah gets up and he goes and he does that. And sometimes it's just about action. It's about doing the right thing. <laughs> Regardless of how you feel, how you think, no matter what, you just do the right thing. I'm not sure what this story says about faith, but it's a story about faith and the complexity of faith. And the action of God in the midst of our lostness. What are you doing here? I loved the contrast, and I wonder if you noticed the contrast of the psalm, this hymn. This is a famous hymn. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after thee. Right? We sing it in church. It's a but it only takes the first line of this psalm. It doesn't take the rest of this psalm because the rest of the psalm is, as a deer thirsts for the water, I am so thirsty. I long for God. And yet tears are my steady diet. Day and night I am plagued by this question, where is God? I cry my heart out. I remember those times when I was in worship and, and, and the grandeur and glory of God felt so real. And yet my heart is now sad and grieving. I am waiting for the Lord and I wait and I wait and I'm wondering, will God show up? My heart is sad. I, I feel like, you know, from the Jordan and Hermon, these mountains, the Jordan River that starts in Mount Hermon and Mount Mizar, and then there's this river that's flowing from the mountains, and you're imagining this white cataract, white water river that's flowing down, and he's just being pummeled by this river. As the torrents crash over me, and that your love, God, sustains me, like in the midst of this torrent of river, but I thought you were my rock, and why have you forgotten me? Why am I bent double under the weight of my insults? The, my enemies, their insults grind me to dust, and day and night they say, where's your God? Is your God real? Is your God even real? 
Why are you sad, my heart? Why do you grieve? This is a psalm about faith. I mean, the song that we sang at the beginning and the end of it are about the upside of this psalm. There is the psalm that this psalm is peppered with, I will yet praise God my Savior. So there's a persistence of the praise of God even in the midst of it. But at some level, you shouldn't sing this song without, singing, without reading the rest of the psalm. Because the rest of the psalm is real and authentic about what happens in the lives of people of faith. Sometimes life sucks, and it feels like God is distant. And yet the psalmist has faith anyway. And then we've got this gospel text where Jesus is going into Gentile territory, like he's leaving Galilee, which is where the, where the Israelite people live, and he's going into Gentile territory on the eastern side of the lake. He steps off the boat and immediately there's this man who is naked, who is scarred and bloody and dirty and smelly, screaming in his face. This man was a problem character for his victims. Like this man was in his village, in his town. This is the one. They tried to lock him up. He was out of control. He caused chaos. He caused damage. I mean, he was the one that in this town, they, they, they talked about him all the time. Did you hear what Mac did? Let's call him Mac. Did you hear what Mac did? There he is again. Their efforts are trying to control him, and they can't control him. And he is tormented by these powers that are greater than himself. He's isolated from himself, he's isolated from his community, and he's involved in self-destruction. And now he's screaming in Jesus' face. And as he's saying, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? And what's curious is he knows Jesus. What's curious is he makes a faith statement, or a doctrinal statement anyway, <laughs> Son of the Most High God. Like, these demons know their doctrine. These demons know their theology. That's curious. Um, and Jesus is like, what's your name? And they're like, Legion. Meaning a Roman military cohort of four to 6,000 men. We are Legion. We are powerful. We have taken this man over. And yet, they recognize the power of God. They recognize the power of Jesus. They somehow know the power of Jesus. And there's this curious moment where they're like, they know how this is going to end. They know that Jesus is going to send them into the abyss. They have that much faith. They're not doubting Jesus at all. They're not doubting Jesus' power at all. It's curious to think of that, right? And they say, please don't send us into the abyss. Send us into these pigs. Which for me is just this baffling part of the story. Why would Jesus... And yet somehow they have a sense of God's grace. They have a sense that maybe Jesus will be gracious to them. And curiously, Jesus is like, okay, sure, go into the pigs. I won't send you into the abyss. I don't know what we do with that, other than to wonder that maybe God's grace is bigger than we can expect. And so the pigs rush into the, the drown in the sea, the swine herds who are taking care of them have just lost all their monetary profit. They go run, or their, their, their you know, capital, like they've just lost a lot of money. They go running into the town, tell everybody, people come and they see what's happened and they are afraid. And this role of fear in these stories, like fear plays such a central role in a lot of these stories. They're afraid. 
And when you're living out of fear, you're not spiritually grounded. And they beg Jesus to leave. They want to cast Jesus out. But the man who is possessed is sitting there in his right mind, and they've given him clothes. And what's curious in this story is he begs Jesus to go with him. Like, I can imagine what his experience was like. Like, he doesn't, he, like, how, does, how can he possibly go back to his people? How can he possibly go back and confront this village where they've seen him crazy and naked and out of control and, you know, whatever, and have bound him for years? Like, what's that like for him to go back into this place? Like, I think, you know, in his mind, he's like, let me just leave. Let me do a change. I need a new life. I need a new start. And what's curious is Jesus, who, you know, walks around, you know, randomly calling people to come and follow me, and they leave whatever they have, and they come and follow him, and Jesus is gradually gathering all these disciples after himself. You would think Jesus would be like, yeah, sure, come on, join us. And Jesus doesn't do that in this case. Jesus says, no, I don't want you to follow me. I want you to go back to your town. And I want you to go back to your family. And I imagine this man's heart is just sinking. <laughs> like, seriously? But I think Jesus is like, it's for your good and their good. Because if you go back and you tell what you, has been done for you, if you go back and they see you in your right mind, maybe they'll begin to change. Maybe they too will be able to get this thing. And so the man goes back and he tells what Jesus had done. And I think that's a moment of faith for him. I don't have any neat, tidy way of wrapping all that up. Other than that, I look at these stories and I see them all as a faith being at work in all those stories in really unexpected ways. It makes me wonder about our own journey of faith, right? Um, can we trust in the faithfulness of, is, is faith really centered in us so that it's our faith in Jesus that matters or actually is it the faithfulness of God that's willing to ask us, what are you doing here? What's your name? Go and be with your people. Amen.